Well, who, who put your hand up if you've seen a Transformers show before? TV show, movie. Wow. I'm, okay, I'm legitimately surprised there's like four of you. Okay. <laughs> ah, well, that's all right. You know the, you, do you all know what a Transformer is? Okay, good. A Transformer, in case you're not aware, for those of us in our church who don't know what Transformers are, a Transformer is something that transforms. Very enlightening, I know. So it, there's a TV show where you have things like trucks and planes and cars, and they transform into robots, don't they? And, and then they do stuff and they defeat the baddies and, and then they hide as cars and stuff like that and they live their life out as cars, they're robots. Now, my favorite Transformer when I was growing up, I can't remember his name because I'm so old now, but was a truck, okay? Yep. Optimus Prime, there we go. My childhood has just come flooding back into my mind. <laughs> Optimus Prime was a big truck. Now, if Optimus Prime could only ever be a truck, would he be a very good transformer? But he wouldn't be able to transform into something. If he could never transform, if he could only ever be a truck, he couldn't really do his job, could he? No, for a transformer to be a transformer, it needs to be able to transform from one thing into another thing. Now, in the Christian's life, there's something a little bit similar to that. You see, when we become a Christian, when, when God saves us, when, when we believe in Jesus, God starts working, well, the truth is he's always been working, but he's working in us to transform us, to change us from what we used to be into Jesus Christ. God wants you and he wants me and he wants all these people and he wants all the believers around the world to be just like Jesus. Now, what that means is if you're not becoming more like Jesus, if you're not being transformed to become more like Jesus, then you have to ask if you're actually a Christian or not. Because Christians are being changed. People who believe in Jesus are being changed. And they're getting made like Jesus. And so the thing we need to ask ourselves, and it's not just for you kids, it's for all of us. We have to ask ourselves, is God at work in my life making me more like Jesus? Okay. And the only way that's going to happen is God at work in us and us trying to do the things that God would love us to do. So let's pray and ask God to help that happen. Fold hands. Close eyes. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for these children. Lord, thank you that you're at work in our lives to make us more like Jesus Christ. Thank you that you love us, that you love us so much that you gave your son to die so that we might become just like him. We pray that you'd help us to follow you, help us to become like you, that we might be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you'd open your Bibles again, we're going to turn to the book of John. John chapter 9. Back to, after our small series, back to our blind man, well, our formerly blind man, no longer blind. John chapter 9. And this morning, we're going to read from verse 24 down to verse 34. So that's John chapter 9, starting at verse 24. This is God's word for you this morning. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? 
And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshipper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. So far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to our hearts, souls, and mind. Let's just come before the Lord and pray. Father in heaven, as we pause before you and just quiet in our hearts, we pray that you would speak to us, not, not through anything new, but through your eternal word, that your word would come to life in our hearts. Lord, there are many of us for whom the word has become stale, for whom the word has become old, Lord, would you make it appear beautiful in our eyes. We pray that, Lord, as we come to open up your word this morning, that you would help us to see the majesty of Jesus Christ, that he would be glorified, that we would be fed. Feed us, now, O oh God. Amen. Well, I'm sure many of you would know the song Amazing Grace, if not all of you. It would be very surprising if anyone didn't know Amazing Grace. Even if you don't go to church, people tend to know Amazing Grace. It gets sung at funerals and pretty much everywhere you go. And I, I'm sure many of you probably know the story behind it. John Newton. Some of you may not. John Newton was quite the amazing lad. His mother died while he was quite young. And so he joined a ship as a sailor with his father. His father was an absolute mess and a wreck of a man. And his son was mistreated and eventually became a slave. Yes, John Newton himself became a slave. And then eventually he escaped from slavery and ended up getting stolen, for lack of a better word, into the army. Someone saw him and grabbed him and threw him in the Navy, and he joined the Navy, and then he tried running away from the Navy and was given eight lashes 12 times in front of 350 men from the ship, as an example. You can imagine not feeling that great. And... And from there, he developed in the experts of slavery, didn't he? And he became a slave trader, very successful slave trader. And he was responsible for carrying men and women, stealing them and selling them as worthless slaves to other places. And this sailor, slave, slave trader eventually became a slave of Christ, didn't he? Eventually, the gospel broke in and he was utterly transformed, became a pastor, and wrote many of our wonderful hymns like Amazing Grace that would save a wretch like me. When you, when you start delving into the stories of these hymn writers, you start to see a depth in these songs which you've just never realized before. Or maybe you've heard of a man, you probably, probably haven't to be fair, a man called Brian Welsh. Maybe you've heard of a band named Corn. 
Probably very, very few of you have heard of a band named Korn. It was a metal band that I loved when I was a teenager. And they had a lead singer named Brian Welsh. And if you don't read through the lyrics, but if you did happen to read through the lyrics, you would find a whole lot of really disgusting, filthy lyrics. Depressing at times. And one day, Korn put out a notice, a public notice, stating that Brian Welsh was leaving the band because he came to know Jesus Christ and he's going to be using his musical talents for the sake of Jesus. Transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or maybe an even more extreme example is a man hanging upon a cross, reviling Jesus and coming to say, Jesus Remember me in paradise. A lifelong criminal. If he could have, bowing at a saviour, at the saviour. And I'm sure if I opened it up, like we already heard from Matthew this morning, I would be able to get story after story after story after story of God powerfully transforming men and women by his gospel, wouldn't I? Honestly, even, even the most, what seems simple, like Matt said this morning, and just a simple covenantal story, the most profound thing, in my opinion, the most profound testimony is someone who has been born in the church and never left. It, it, I think it's one of the greatest miracles is that someone would be born in the church and raised in the church and just love Christ their whole life and look back and say, I can never remember a time where I didn't love Christ. I just always remember loving Jesus. That is, if anything, the most profound testimony. So every one of you, if you believe in Jesus, could stand up here and say, this is how God transformed my life. And the same is true for this blind beggar, isn't it? His life radically transformed, radically changed forever. Never again will the world be the same for this blind beggar because Jesus radically transformed him from a blind sinner to a seeing worshiper. This is our God, brothers and sisters. This is our Savior. This is what He does. He takes wretches like me and makes us see. Miracle upon miracle. Do you know what we're going to spend eternity doing? Running into millions of people and going, Really? Is that how God saved you? That's amazing. We're never going to get tired of it. It's going to be myriads upon myriads upon myriads of stories of the grace of God poured out for sinners. And, and, and what, what John is highlighting, you remember John's goal is for you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So what John is doing is highlighting this transforming power of Christ with the unbelievable unbelief of the Pharisees. It's both, both extremes, isn't it? The Pharisees, it's, just, it just, it's hard to get your mind around how incredibly thick and stubborn and hard-hearted they are. And so what I'd like us to do is just contrast through the story, through these 10 verses, the Pharisees and, and this blind man. First contrast, consider the knowledge they have. Have a look at the Pharisees in verse 24. For the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. See the hypocrisy of their knowledge? Give glory to God, they say. Meanwhile, they're failing to give glory to God. 
God, now regardless of their opinion of Jesus, God has just miraculously healed a blind man, something which we find out later has never been done. You don't find it in the Old Testament ever, a blind man getting their sight back. It's incredible. And rather than giving the glory to God themselves, they, they come to this blind man, rebuking him and reviling him and hating him. You, you give glory to God. We know the truth. You give glory to God. We have the knowledge. You clearly don't give God the glory. But they've got a false knowledge, don't they? We know. We know this man is a sinner. How do they know that? They don't know that. Jesus is sinless. He healed a man on the Sabbath. And he already showed them a couple of chapters ago that that was not breaking God's law, but it was fulfilling God's law. And so he's healed on the Sabbath again, and they want to call him a sinner. We know he's a sinner. But they don't. They don't know Jesus is a sinner. But isn't it a proud knowledge? The pride behind that? As they sit on their seats of honor, as they sit on their judgment seats and condemn Jesus, and as they condemn this blind man, just filled with despise, filled with hatred and anger and bitterness, But contrast that with this blind man's simple, simple knowledge. Have a look at verse 25. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Isn't it profoundly simple? Now give glory to God. And he just says, look, I don't know. He's a sinner. I don't know. Because he doesn't. So I've got no idea. I've, he spoke to me. He said one line to me. And he disappeared. I've got no idea if this guy's a sinner or not. It's so simple. And yet profoundly true. He says, I don't know. But look, this is what I know. I've been blind my whole life. But he opened my eyes. I've been blind my entire life, and now I see you guys. It's incredibly simple. It's incredibly humble, isn't it? He doesn't take the, the high place. He doesn't seek to jump to conjecture or to make assumptions about who Jesus is and what type of a man he was and whether he's a sinner. He just says, I'll deal with what I know. And, you know, we can... We can learn something from that, can't we? Belief in Jesus is simple. Remember the, the text that tells us God uses the foolish things of the world. You see, the world looks at us, looks at believers, and thinks we're a bunch of morons. I mean, how could you really believe that stuff? The Jews say, how could you really believe there's three gods? The world said, how could you really believe that some big God in the sky made everything? We're despised, rejected, and hated. We're called fools. And yet we have a simple trust in Jesus Christ. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had to say to someone, I don't, I don't know, I can't explain that. You know, how, how, can, how could it be possible that God created the world in six days and yet it looks like it's really old? I don't know. I, I don't know. But God's word says to me, he made the heavens and the earth in six days. And so I will just simply and humbly submit myself to God's word and how he reveals himself. 
and I'll allow God to be the judge of that. It's going to be a whole heap of people, all of us, who will one day stand before God at the end of time and he's going to say, yeah, you guys got it all wrong. It was actually like this. Let me just rewind and push play so you can watch how creation happened. And we're going to go, oh, that's how you did it. That's amazing. Just a simple, humble knowledge. These, these religious experts refuse to be transformed. Because they refuse to let go of their superior knowledge. They refuse to let go of their understanding. It's my way or the highway is the religious expert. And, and if Jesus doesn't conform with my knowledge, then I don't want anything to do with it. Isn't that the attitude of the Pharisee? Yeah, and, and we do have to be careful because we can fall into that. Now, maybe you've had someone say to you before, a, a Christian say to you before, well, I could never deal with a God who's like that. I, I want nothing to do. I've had someone say this. I shouldn't call them a Christian, but I've had someone say to me once, I'll leave that to God to judge. I've had someone say to me once, I'll have nothing to do with a God who chooses people to go to heaven and lets other people go to hell. And I said, but it's just what the Bible says. Whether I can deal with that in my heart and rationalize that or not, actually makes no difference because God says it in his word. And so we simply accept it. And as we simply accept it, we begin to be transformed by the renewal of our mind, don't we? Isn't that what Paul says? Be, be transformed, Romans 12. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Allow your mind as you soak in the word, as you see the work of Christ like this man did, as you feel the effects of what God is doing, allow your mind to be transformed. And as your mind is transformed, it filters down through every part of your being. And so God longs, he works, he takes his word and imprints it upon our mind so that we're renewed, so that our mind is different than it was before we became a believer, before last year. You know, we're at the end of the year. Can you look back at last year and say, yeah, maybe, maybe it's just this much, but I feel like my mind is just, my knowledge is just transformed by Christ just a little bit more. I know Christ just a little bit deeper. He's mine. And I know that more than I did last year. Or is your knowledge actually keeping yourself away from Christ? Because you're stubborn and refuse to come to Christ on Christ's terms. But not only is there this contrast of knowing, there's a contrast of hearing, isn't there? Have a look at verse 26. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The Pharisees didn't want to listen to the man, did they? He told them. He's already told them this whole story earlier in the chapter. He's already told this whole story to his neighbors, to his friends, his family, who brought him to the Pharisees. And so when they, they ask for it again, you can feel his exasperation, can't you? He's like, come on. And you know, the interesting thing is, when the, when the Pharisees, when he says to the Pharisees, why do you want to hear it again? 
do you also want to become his disciples? In the Greek, that's a negative question. Effectively, you don't actually want to become his disciples, do you? Question mark. Us knowing what the answer is going to be. No. You see, he, he gets it, doesn't he? The Pharisees have, have turned their ears off. They don't want to listen to him. What they want is this man to say that Jesus is a sinner. What they want, what they're waiting for, is Jesus to, for this man to say, Jesus healed me on the Sabbath. That's what they're looking for. They're fishing for it. And they don't want to hear what he actually thinks. They just want to hear what they want to hear. You know how these conversations go with your children? You're speaking to them, and at some point during the discussion, you say, are you actually listening? And they say, yeah, yeah. And you say, no, no, not hearing. Are you listening? And you could say of these Pharisees, they were hearing. They weren't listening, were they? They weren't hearing what the words and absorbing them in their brain and heart and saying, there's something going on here. They should have heard the words and gone, something profound has happened. But instead, they turn their sights upon Moses, don't they? They say, no, 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 we heard Moses. And you know the profoundly, um, the, the indictment that that is for them. It's, it's profound. Have a look back at John chapter 5, if you've got your Bibles open still, which you should. John chapter 5, verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you had believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. They are damning themselves when they say, we have heard from Moses. And you can hear the echo of John pointing you back to John 5 and saying, you remember, what, remember what Jesus said? If you believed Moses, you would believe me. Because Moses wrote about Jesus. Moses pointed to Jesus and said, this is him. This is the one you are to expect. This is the one you're meant to listen to. It was echoed. Do you remember the father at the baptism of Jesus? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. At the transfiguration, this is my son. Listen to him. And yet the Pharisees won't have a bar of it. And they damn themselves. And the question for you and I is, are we listening to the voice of Christ? Are we listening to the words of Christ? You know, when the Bible is opened and read, Christ is speaking. When the word is faithfully preached, Christ is speaking. Are you listening? Or is it bouncing off you? You know, could, could Jesus stand amongst us and say, you're hearing, but you're not listening? Or are we like the blind man, the simple blind man? Verse 7 of chapter 9. Sorry, verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed. Verse 11, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. I heard the voice of Jesus 
and I went, and now I see. Have you heard the voice of Jesus, and now you see? Or do you still keep searching and asking? You know, I read this week of a man who used to come to this church quite a while ago now, and he's now going to the Catholic Church. It's a rejection of the gospel. He didn't hear the voice of Jesus. And don't bother asking me who it is because I'm not going to tell you later. <laughs> but have you heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest? And you heard it and went, I'll rest. I come to you, Jesus, and I rest. It's a very simple thing, isn't it? Salvation is simplistic. It's not hard work. Oh, following Christ is hard work. You've got a cross to carry, but coming to Jesus. Remember what Jesus says, my burden is light. Compared to this world's burden, my burden is light. And my yoke is easy because I'm carrying it. Have you heard him? Romans tells us that faith comes through hearing the word of Christ. But it's not just knowing as an issue or hearing as an issue, but ultimately it's a believing issue, isn't it? Have a look at verse 30. The man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Consider the man for a moment. He believes in the amazing work of Jesus, doesn't he? He hears all of their objections. He, he, he takes all of their reviling. And he says, this is an amazing thing. It is, isn't it? This is an amazing thing that Jesus Christ has done. And he is filled with awe. He's filled with amazement at what Jesus Christ has done. He knows this is special. He knows this is spectacular. He knows this is amazing. And he believes that, that Jesus will open his eyes, doesn't he? Remember all the way back in the beginning, Jesus chucks mud on his face. He could have just been like, ooh, no, I'm just going to go over there and wash this filth off my face. Thanks very much for spitting and rubbing it in my eyes. But he says, I believe Jesus can do this. And he walks to Siloam and washes his eyes off and comes back seeing. He believes that Jesus can do what he says. That's what he says in verse 30. He opened my eyes. Don't you get it, Pharisees? I can see. It's a miracle. God has done something stupendous. And, and he believes that Jesus is devoted to God in verse 31. If anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Now, this word for worshiper is, is similar to the word we use for pious or devoted, devotion. It's this idea of someone who just devotes themselves wholeheartedly to a deity. He's saying, the only way 
that Jesus is getting listened to by God is if he's wholeheartedly committed to God to do his will, to worship him, to praise him, to love him, to follow him. What's the logical conclusion? My eyes are opened. Therefore, God listened to him. Therefore, he is of God. You see, the man believes ultimately that Jesus is God's appointed Savior. He, he, he may not know the full ramifications. In fact, he wouldn't have known the full ramifications of all of this. He wouldn't have understand all of it, understood all of it properly. But he knew that this man, the man that gave him his sight, was a representative of God who came to do the work of God. But the Pharisees, they believe the lie of the devil, don't they? You were born in utter sin. Do you remember when we first turned to chapter 9, we saw the, the question the disciples asked? The disciples said, who sinned to make this man blind? That, that lie of the devil, that, that all brokenness in this world is due to a particular sin. The Pharisees have swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, haven't they? You were born in utter sin. You can have no understanding. You've got no knowledge. You don't know anything. The Pharisees are completely unteachable, aren't they? This, this, was, this was their gospel opportunity. If ever there was a gospel opportunity for the Pharisees, it's right now. Staring them right in the face, actually seeing them right in the face. And they refuse to have any part of it. They excommunicate him from the synagogue. That means he can never join in Jewish worship again. He's removed from the temple. He's removed from everything effectively that it means to be a Jew. They cast him out. And they revile him. They revile him in verse 28. You know, the word for revile him is the same word that's used for Jesus Christ. Is that a profound thing that John is alluding to? Blessed are you when they revile you for my name's sake. And John's pointing to something, isn't he? This man was being reviled because he loves Jesus. It's the, it's the evidence. We saw it a couple of weeks ago. It's the evidence, the suffering. It's the evidence that he's a believer in Christ as the world reviles him. Jesus radically transformed this man, didn't he? I mean, you just, just think about the progress in this man's life in one day. He goes from begging his whole life. Like, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Begging. There's no audio tapes in the first century. There's no smartphone to read to you. Like it amazes me for Anne. Your phone just does everything. It's incredible. You don't have that in the first century. You're just blind. That's all you are, is just blind. It's a blind beggar who boldly stands up to his friends. And neighbors who boldly stands up to the Pharisees, who makes the Pharisees look a bit like a joke, doesn't he? He outsmarts and outspeeches the Pharisees, the religious experts and leaders of their day, because God has radically transformed this man. Just like John Newton. Just like Martin Luther, just like John Calvin, just like Stuart Townend, just I could just list all your names off. It's the exact same thing, isn't it? God turns up by his Holy Spirit, bursts open your heart, bursts open your ears, bursts open your eyes, and you know, you see, you hear, you believe in Jesus Christ, and your world is never the same again. 
I mean, tell me that your life is the same as before you became a believer. It's just not, is it? You look back and you think, how did I do those things? You look back and you think, why would I do that? Why did I act like that? You look back and you say, how did I not see? How did I not see how amazing Jesus Christ is? This is the work of Christ. He's a glorious Savior. He's filled with grace and mercy and love so that you might be set free. But maybe you're sitting here this morning and you haven't changed. You know, maybe it's been 30 years since you first came into church and you still haven't changed. You feel like there's never been a change. You look back and you think to yourself, well, I don't see anything different. Have you heard Christ? Have you come to know Christ? Have you believed in Jesus? That's the only way. It's not through church attendance. It's not through rituals. It's not through your parents. It's through coming to the Son of God and believing that He is a Savior. Will you come today? Will you come and believe in Him? Tomorrow may not be there. Let's pray. Father, would you so work in our hearts that we might never be like the Pharisees? Would you so work in our hearts that we might be like this man who was born blind, knowing you, hearing you, you and believing in you lord may we along with john newton sing out amazing grace it saves a wretch like me lord i once was lost but now i'm found we were all blind but now we all see it is amazing grace, God, that you would save the people like us. Turn us towards you again afresh this morning. In Jesus' name we pray.